speechless. No, that's cool, huh? There's so much stuff going in my that is that's yeah. the most powerful thing I've ever heard on a podcast or audio book or anything ever. And I'm not just saying that. Like oh, that's wow. that's straight up like the most because Welcome back to another amazing episode of the Corey Boutwell podcast. Today we have on Matt Legg, one of the creators of the brand ATP Science that you may have seen in all health stores everywhere and this conversation is amazing we get truly deep and you do not want to miss out on this conversation i will just say at the start of the podcast it was a little bit breaky uppy in terms of the sound quality but about a quarter of the way in it is perfect for the entire quality of the program and there are some nuggets the nuggets are at the end of the podcast but to understand them you have to go through the stuff at the start and i cannot explain to you how important it is we're in cover we cover over love masturbation gut microbiome, what you can actually do in your life to improve the quality of your life and Matt's journey and how he ended up being the healthiest he's ever been in his entire life, but it caused everything to break. So if you like anything from this podcast, please hit that subscribe button. And if you're interested in becoming the best version of yourself for others who need you to be, especially if you recognize that you're the most important asset of your business, please hit some of the links below. So I hope you guys enjoy this podcast without any further ado. We'll see on the inside. So Matt Leg has just told me that he's coming up with a new supplement called Super Browns. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's another one that was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, it's so awesome that you're um, coming onto the show. For everyone that doesn't know, like you've been in naturopathy, as you've mentioned beforehand, for like 25 years, you created um atp science one of those brands and you've done all of these like awesome amazing things and i first started listening to your podcasts with so much learning all the different knowledge in there so i'm i'm super pumped to have you on and i'm also <laughs> excited to know like what you've recently been learning and focusing your time and attention oh. on well i tell you lately i said i i've become fully obsessed with the whole holistic system because in all those times of working like um, you know, you're, you're fully holistic in a clinic because you're constantly looking for, are we going to get results or excuses? You know, so we're trying to manage through the case to make sure that these people are going to get the results that they deserve for their investment. They're not going to actually just make excuses famous. Um, and so it's a big part of the clinic. But then when you get out of the clinic and you into like product development um, and you're trying to make like products for the masses and, and suitable products that will get results, but you know, not create too much drama and everything like that. Um, you kind of can get a little bit focused in on in on how a product will work, um, and that's not how the system works. So basically, I've taken a step back, you know, from just that innovation specifically for product development and the creation of information that revolves around, you know, like marketing that product or something, to take a step back and go the whole holistic system like what is really missing and and how could a product really just help someone if that's all we're giving them um when we know that if their their posture is bad if their lifestyle is bad if they're like slept stress or not sleeping and thinking that we can fix everything through a supplement or especially when we consider things like gut health and that sort of stuff when we know yeah, stress and priorities but mainly diet you know like what you eat will determine what's in your guts to a massive degree so the holistic system is the thing that i'm most passionate about and been looking right back into um and that's one of the things that when you're part of a brand you're really stuck you can't really um provide free information and education around a holistic system because everything seems to be therapeutic claims um it, it is a very tricky place to be in so to take a step back and just go oh man i'm just going to be free to think and then experiment on myself, uh, which I didn't do for all that time and got real fat and stuff. <laughs> but yeah. So like what what do you do? That's my thing. What are some like, you know, sort of possible solutions? Is it educate the visual uh, individual, help them make their lifestyle choices and then have the right products? Like what is how do you Yeah, it's to do with protocols, but it, the protocols have to be holistic. Um, and I didn't realize the importance of such things as posture and that sort of stuff. Like if you consider that your brain is constantly gathering data, your whole new, I shouldn't say brain. And this is the other thing about a holistic system. Everything I think I know I've thrown out the window because 
what is the brain? What is the mind and spirit? Like, where do these things reside? And is there a hierarchy? I don't know if there is, you know, like, um, and so basically, uh, yeah, the understanding that if you've got a bad posture that's telling your brain that you're probably under stress, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm protecting my heart. I've got the hair on my back standing up for us that have it. Um, um, I'm like leaning forward and I'm on my, my balls on my feet and I'm back on my heels, my head's forward. Like these are all defensive posture, stress posture. So if you combine the fact that I might have maybe some allergies or intolerances to creating some inflammation in my gut, maybe I have some toxic exposure, maybe my air's not great, maybe I'm mouldy surrounded by mold um maybe i have an injury or a, a trauma or, or a memory of a trauma and an injury and all of these things that might be coming into my system at the same time as i have a posture that's telling my body that you're possibly fighting something or i'm living a lifestyle that suggests that i'm possibly you know under attack or if i'm not fighting and running i maybe should be hiding because i'm not relaxing enough and going in all of these things together will combine to create the symptom picture um, all of these things together would be um, what manifests as you know epigenetics you know and, and our genetic expression and that sort of stuff as opposed to oh you, you all your problems come from a gluten intolerance or all your problems come from um this or or the other one was the modalities you know I always so biased i mean i was a herbalist and a nutritionist i was so biased with that i learned enough about homeopathy to be dangerous really um but the the reality is is you know i'm biased towards certain modalities but then you realize that there's people get results um from different people for different things you know and and, and in the holistic system it all starts to I tell you what, though, on the way to that, I had like a massive like meltdown, um, not a meltdown, but like a uh, like a reset into the way my brain works because. Um, tell me about it. I'd love to hear about this, it. I drew this diagram once trying to explain it to someone that, and I'll get that up for you and everything. Like that, but so um, perceived knowledge um, versus experience. And it's not a like a linear, it's more of a parabola. So it means that what I'm, what I'm saying is that we all have this phase that we go through where we believe it's possible to know everything about a topic or it's possible to actually get to that level of um, knowledge that we might be able to call ourselves an expert or um, we, we may even see other people that we perceive to be experts and think that man these guys know everything about a topic or at least they're on their way you know they're not far off knowing everything however as we get more and more experience we realize there is just simply so much to know about a topic and you can't know everything about everything or everyone if you're capable of dropping that ego <laughs> and understanding that your perceived knowledge is is basically just that it's your perceived knowledge it's not possible to know everything and you can't possibly be the smartest person in every room it, it is a it's a it's a if you've got an ego you might get freak out a little bit and go oh man, everything I thought I knew was wrong or every rule that I've based my knowledge around has just been proven to be incorrect, um, that the science wasn't settled, um, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and then you get into this phase where you go, that's awesome because no one knows everything. There's so much more to learn. There's so much more innovation we can do. Uh, and that we can learn a little bit of everything from every place and incorporate all that sort of stuff. It, it's, it's liberating and it's also exciting to know that you can take no matter how far you get into an industry, you think there's so much more to go and you haven't even touched the surface. So, and that, that's the meltdown, the ego had to get thrown away and then, you know, move forward with soul and go, no, 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 this is all for the good of the peeps. <laughs> <laughs> well, was that your experience as well? Did you have that moment with you? Cause you do like, I've listened to your podcast before, you know, oh, man. so much, so much, but you're just like, Oh God, I, I know so much, but I know nothing. Like what, what was that like? That's exactly, it's exactly what happens. And, and you get that imposter syndrome, you know, like, man, I'm fraud. Here I am being, talking about an expert as if saying that this has been proven in a study, so therefore it's true. And then you're going through and then you find the, the, the opposite also proven in a study, which is also true. And then you're just like, so what is it? Well, we're all individuals, I guess. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I don't know where we got to, but I basically said I got real fat. <laughs> So you sort of had this um, <laughs> you're learning about all these different things, no, no, especially no. being in the health industry <laughs> as well. And then you're learning all about all this stuff. And then you started questioning all your beliefs. And then because of all of that, you're just like, well, I'm 
It's going to start eating. Well, yeah, and, and I was also rebellious. I think by nature, I've always been a bit... And you got yeah. rebellious and you went, you know what, I'm learning all these facts. But they're not right. They can't tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just like I spend all day talking about what people should eat, and what they shouldn't eat, eat and how they should live their life. And at the end of the day, go, man, I'm really exhausted from that. I might go drink some beer and eat a pie and go to the pub with the boys and, and then, like, rebel. I just didn't want to be, you know, it's just like I've done this all day. That's my job. I don't want to do it all night and all weekend and everything as well. So, but yeah, that's just me being dodgy. But um, with when I was working in the health industry, I was spending so much time researching, you know, for product development and researching other people's problems. I just totally tried to ignore all mine. Um, but yeah, I put on like 30 kilos. Um, yeah, which I've lost in about, three to six months now once I worked it out and oh man I worked out so much crazy stuff because I end up tell me oh okay and this is so important because you've got so I'm like I just turned 46 all right um so I'm getting old and I've got relatively young kids you know they're only seven and eight and I was at a point where I was a big fat guy I couldn't kick the footy I couldn't even walk them to school because of all this pain I was in it was just like, this is bullshit. And here I am trying to tell people how to be healthy. And I was like, you're an imposter. You're a fraud, you know. Um, but what I'd also realized is I'd, I'd actually formed myself into some full-on patterns. Oh, patterns I thought to be healthy, you know. Like I'd eat, I, I like tried to make sure these certain rules where I do exercise all the time, regardless of how I was feeling. And I'd always exercise with intensity because I had to punish myself for that food I'd eaten and my missed days at the gym and the fact that I got so fat. And I had to make up all that time every day. Uh, I had to win every day. Um, I also decided, you know, I need to get my, what do they say, five cups of veggies and three serves of fruits or something like that. So I'd get my my veggies in and I'd get my fruits in and I'd get all of my bits and pieces, but you know, I was busy um, and in a habit of, I, I wasn't my own cook or anything. I had the wife and that sort of stuff that there's certain food that we buy. So I end up eating the same bloody foods all the time, even though they're pretty healthy. I had what I call a balanced diet, but not a varied diet. Mm. I then got into some bad habits where I was so consistent with some things that over the time, things that used to work for me stopped working for me. And then I'm like, this is bullshit. You know, this stuff doesn't work. Um, or, um, you know, what have I done? Or there's something else wrong with my system. Or it's because I'm fat. It's because I'm not training hard enough. It's because I'm not putting enough intensity into things and everything. So what I realized is my gut microbiome, I'd fed it a consistent diet. So here's my gut microbiome that was designed through evolution to keep me alive, help with my survival, maintain my system through phases of feast and famine. Here's my microbiome. It's when I'm low in nutrients, it should be capable of making it. When my hormones drop, it should be capable of filling in the gaps. When I have my energy production pathways and that sort of stuff exhausted, or when I'm in a fat burning mode through um, famine, or if I'm in building mode through feast, my microbiome should be able to adapt and support me because I'm their host and they're supposed to keep me alive and, and keep me functioning. However, those silly things were designed with through fruit seasons and other seasons where they're designed to eat a certain amount of food for a short period of time and then it disappears for a long period of time before it comes back. I'm supposed to have a big variety in my food. And my food is supposed to be very high in these polyphenols and tannins and astringents and fibres and seeds and skins. It's not supposed to be just saying that I'm giving you the fruit. It's got the sugar, but none of the fibre and none of the polyphenols. So, over the years, man, my gut overgrew certain bugs so much. So some bugs thrived on those foods and they did really well. Other bugs were starved off. And they, the reality is, is most people that I see in the clinic don't have a deficiency of bugs. They've got an overgrowth. I mean, everyone talks about SIBOs and FODMAPs and dysbiosis. They're all overgrowths, candidiasis, all overgrowth. And the overgrowth comes from overfeeding them and overfeeding them consistently. And then they can alter my calorie yield, a whole heap of testing. You know, time in decades, I actually went and had a look um, and tested all my stuff um, and found some weird stuff, like where I had major uh, good stuff. Like everyone would test it, value it's really healthy. You've got all the right names. But when I measured the doses and the levels, I had so much imbalance in my microbiome, overgrowth, good things. Um, but that contributed to things like gout. 
um, uric acid build up. I could fix gout all the time. And then with me, I started getting it. And then oxalates and then obesity and then pain and inflammation. And then next thing you know, the tryptophan steel started happening and I was sad and like sooky and stuff. And like everything. And then so basically I did a full reset. I went through and just totally reset my whole microbiome that I 40 years building. And you got to realize like by the time you get mid forties and you think you're a relatively healthy dude and you think you know some stuff, there's certain things that you do for decades, like consistently for decades. And by the time you realize that it was good for a period of time. So everything in nature is that parabola. There's a sweet spot, you know, it was good for a period of time, but then I pushed it too far. We're now at bad. Like my med my food, that was my medicine was starting to become my poison. And it was because I changed my gut microbiome and I didn't do the proper resets because I totally lost my connection with nature. I totally forgot you know, that food is on trees and that, um, that, you know, normally you'd be hunting and gathering and not shopping or delivering or ordering. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, and so I had to go full back to nature, back to the garden, back to the beach, back to hunting and gathering, and then realise that, man, you've been beating yourself up. Give yourself a break exercise is supposed to be your time to reward and celebrate the fact that you can actually do things. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just changed everything. And then my whole body shape changed. Like, and the weirdest thing that happened, man, is I, once I understood that my cravings were certain bugs that wanted me to feed them. And then as I took their food away, that make me crave it more. And I'd be like, no, screw you. I'm not feeding you, man. And I'd throw poison down instead. So then I get like the cravings for these foods. I know it's the bugs trying to trick me. So it's like, here, I'm going to disguise some, you know, you like sugar? Well, here, take these polysaccharides. They're going to poison you. Yeah. And then, get, <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then like totally change my microbiome. And then I realized that the other bugs, they're not even, the ones that I was missing, you're not available in a supplement, which is part of the reason why they were missing because that was one of the things never available. The only way I could build up my gut bugs is through cardiovascular exercise, changing my diet, pushing through endurance, getting myself breathing out carbon through fat burning and exercise to build up my acomanzias. And it was like, it changed everything. And then all of a sudden, appetite changes, cravings change, my metabolic rate changes. I lost the 30 kilos in you know, three to six months. I wasn't really, I don't even know, I can tell you, but that was you know, over 12 months ago. You know, So like I've maintained this weight now without doing anything other than what I want to do <laughs> and and be happy with it. It's it's a it's almost as if like you were so. supposed to like go through that and chuck all of that weight on so that you could really simply just figure out all the things to be like, oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. And now my mates are grateful that I did it because a lot of my mates that were the lean fit dudes, you know, I was always a bigger guy. Um, and they always had this lucky metabolism. You know, I always called it a lucky metabolism, but they did it. They were exercising and had better food choices than me, you know. Um, but those dudes now over the years, all of a sudden it doesn't work for them anymore. Um, but all of a sudden they've put on a heap of weight. And But that's what I'm talking about is these things that work for you over time um, eventually will build a microbiome that is just overpopulated and out of balance and it will change absolutely everything. Like, it's phenomenal. Like, how many old blokes you treat with things like gout and stuff like that, where it's all about, oh, we've got to strip out these uric acids and we've got to change what you're eating. And the reality is, is our microbiome should be clearing away majority of those urates and that sort of stuff and not making them. So you're finding that all of a sudden you get a change microbiome and you've got bugs that are generating uric acid and pumping it into your system instead of helping you eliminate it from your foods. And then you find the same thing with oxalates where, you know, 90% of the oxalates we consume from our good healthy diet of sweet potatoes and spinach and berries and cherries and all the stuff that we tell people to do when they want to be healthy, that makes them feel like crap when they start if they got the wrong microbiome. And then all of a sudden, it's like instead of 90% going, they're actually, jet, they're, all of it's coming into the body, plus they're generating more. These people have 150% of an oxalate dietary load because they're making it. And then all of a sudden, their nerves are there, they're sore and their kidneys are piling up. It's like, it's blowing my mind how many of these patterns that I see in people as they get, and I don't know, I'm, I'm talking like 30s, mid 30s is long enough, um, mid 20s. I mean, if you're consistent enough, and I'm talking a lot of people that 
eat a what we called a healthy diet and live a healthy lifestyle. They just do it so consistently that it only takes a decade of that. And next thing you know, your microbiome is so out of balance, man. So <laughs> it's crazy. So it sort of like gets me on to the next question is like, well, like, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, what do you do? Is that well, so so much? I know there, there is so much, but it's also not that much because if we understand that it's a holistic system with nature, and when I say, hang on, I'll see if this thing's here. This might be, this is the sort of thing. Oh, you're not going to be able to see that, are you? No, I'm going to send it, it through. So I these are my it. sort of my mind maps. Oh, yeah. That's actually, so a, that's actually that a beautiful love. mind map, that is. Yeah, so you go through and you see the hierarchy of the mucosal yeah. immunity, all the things that we're exposed to from that's the beautiful. environment. We see that, and then we see how it affects all the different systems. We've got to understand that everyone fits within these holistic systems. We can use our symptom picture a lot to assess your priorities and work out where you are in space and time. Um, but the reality is, is when you go through this over and over and over and over again, you actually start to find some patterns, which is basically going back. Like if you've got an overgrowth of bugs, it's like having your yard full of weeds. Which yeah. that, that you know that common analogy with the naturopath, the weed seed feed thing, yeah. So you get the, the but the difference is using probiotics to fix that is like throwing grass seeds at weeds. Mm. And it's not going to make the weeds get up and leave. Um, and it's definitely not going to be able to compete with an established weed. And also, too, if you consider that these probiotics is the same half a dozen strains, and they're just the stable ones that are available everywhere, which is why they're the only ones that are available in probiotics. Now, if we consider that most of the fermented foods, and that's the stuff that made probiotics famous, actually aren't very good sources of probiotics. They're actually what we call postbiotics. And postbiotics is actually the the end result of fermentation. So we'll have some live organisms, but the point is, is by the time you've made, you know, sauerkraut or kimchi or kombucha or something like that, the levels of acid and enzymes and that sort of stuff in these things is kills off most of the bugs. Mm -hmm. The only ones that can survive are certain ones that fill up the spaces to prevent further infection. However, the sugars have been converted to short chain fatty acids. The other compounds have liberated enzymes. We have uh, the polyphenols, uh, you know, like we talk about a lot of stuff with herbal medicine um, where we've got these simple compounds. And we also know how one herb works for one person doesn't work for another necessarily. Um, a lot of these polyphenols that we can't absorb actually get converted through the microbiome to create postbiotic metabolites like you know, uh, one that we'll see a lot more of in the future are urolithins and that sort of stuff, which I've discovered come out of like the oak barrels that they use to ferment things or like the, the pomegranate peels and all these bits and pieces. And they convert through to these chemicals. But depending on what your microbiome is, is what chemicals may be made out of those starting material. And so people have just stuck in this thing going, oh, we'll just throw in some probiotics and we'll eat a good, healthy, balanced diet. And that's or that that's the key to health it's like no no the key to health is following the laws of nature eating local and what's in season if you've been eating the same foods over and over and over again for a long period of time there's a fair chance you're going to overgrow certain bugs that we need to kill off and you're not going to kill them off by um throwing probiotics at them you're going to kill them off by using antimicrobials and then you go cool so where do we get these antimicrobials oh they're found in the peels, the skins, the roots, the seeds. And if you have a look at all the herbal medicine, it's like, man, you could almost, most things you can go and find the, the bark, the peel and the skin, anything that's got these astringent tenons that protect the inside sugars from the bugs. And then we go, oh, that kind of makes sense now. So my gut is also full of bugs. And if I throw food in there that doesn't have these poisons in it, then I'm just giving straight food to my bugs. They're going to overgrow. So the simple concept of going through and going eat local, eat in season, straight away, people are going to cycle their diets. You're going to not be able to eat the same food. And I, I've got like 60 something fruit trees in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And so I try to eat as much as I can out of my yard, but I'll only have that food for what a week or two, um, maybe a month where I've just got a heap of it and then it's gone. So you, you like binge like crazy on something for a period of time and then you just go without for a while, you know? Um, 
and you have these cycles. And when you watch, when you see them in the real world, ripen and how they all bloody ripen at once, it's it's not like grocery shopping each week where you can get the right level of ripeness to eat it. You know what I mean? It, yeah. it changes everything. So following the laws of nature straight away, man. Yeah, yeah, you're going to be cycling your diet. Um, and if you also realize that you should be eating these things that, you know, seedless grapes and that are normal and stuff like you want to get all of those compounds and you go back and look at all your herbal medicine textbooks and you'll see that most of the things that have these antimicrobial effects is all the skins, the peels, the seeds, the fiber, the roots. It's like you go back to nature and it's so smart and then realize that we also should be exercising. And there's a couple of basic rules we can go through. Then you get into the real fun stuff. Because what I'm talking about is that is just boring base foundation. That is just building us a stable state with which we can launch from. So then once we've got that stable state, we've got that beautiful base foundation where I know you've got adequate nutrition to make sure everything's possible. You, you, you've got a nice balance between your survive mode and thrive mode where you're capable of actually achieving things. Then we can go through and go, right, what do you want to do with your life? Who do you want to be? How do you want to feel and do you have anything else that you'd like to just achieve you know that we can help you towards you know so that's where you get into that fun stuff and usually it's like oh i just want to be like a sexual tyrannosaurus or i want to be like (laughs) my entrepreneurial skills or or an athlete and you know um the weekend at the weekend warriors and everyday athletes have exactly the same ambitions as our elite athletes they want to achieve their personal goals and that sort of stuff and that's why i love where you get the boring stuff out of the way which is like go back to nature get your stable state most of these disease symptoms sort of stuff disappear in that instance and then we can go through and go right now let's let's go next level so that that's the fun stuff so i I pretty much believe that we can educate and provide a better society we fix all the boring stuff but then we can have a lot of fun and get these really cool uh, because what i love is the experimenting stuff like once you've got that base foundation and that stable state to then have a tribe of lab rats and like a crew, because I, I love getting a crew. Um, there's something special about getting a crew of experts working with a group of people that are just willing participants to have a crack because the stuff that you can do um, once you've built that stable state and base foundation and then utilizing these tools to achieve specific goals, just the trial phases alone so cool because sometimes even in the trial phases you know you you get to experiment with some stuff that you can't you just might never find on the shelves um for different reasons and regulations but when you're dealing with these groups and these tribes you can share information that you can never share in the public domain um now i'm actually excited about um future of things like that you know like the, the metaverse and and trying to find these new domains where they're yet to be overregulated. where we can get in and everyone can have a crap you know good transparency good communication can share information share resources um you know, i can just imagine like these virtual health retreats all my experts coming in doing this stuff i don't i'm excited about it so i think that's massive future it's gonna be so much fun <laughs> yeah i think that because you can tell her like how excited you are getting yeah. about that because it just makes it so handy like just that crazy information because it makes so much sense that you figure out all these things that you're definitely not allowed to put somewhere whatever it is using different herbs and stuff and like imagine it'd be so beneficial for so many people and you're like oh if only we could get this out there and, and you're not allowed to this is the frustrating thing and this is what to be honest it really bugged me a little bit with the naturopath stuff because I wanted to share this. The only time I could do it, I could share this information with my clients, but it was like kind of one-on-one. And then the person, a lot of the people don't care. They're just like, just tell me what to do. I don't (laughs) care about, I don't care about your beliefs and, you know, your passion and stuff. Um, And it's it's really hard because as a practitioner, you, you can say these things, but you can't say it out. You can't educate people. And the problem is that I've had in the past is if you've got products, you know, if you sell products, then, they, they, the regulators don't believe that it's possible to, um, you know, why would anyone share free information? Obviously, it's a trap. You know, it's marketing. You're trying to lead to sales, you know. So, and, and it's kind of true too, but it was, it's a weird backwards way because I, I managed to build a company that would sell the products that would pay the bills and, and get 
the build the platform to which we can share informa free information. But then it's perceived the other way from the regulators that, you know, you're, why would you give out free information? Everything you're giving away is to market your product, even if it wasn't related to them. And, and so you just get totally censored and you can't talk. And then you've got to realise, well, most people out there, I mean, not many people out there are rich enough just to spend all their time just sharing information because they're passionate about it. Um, because they still got to pay their bills, you know? So that, that I find is a, that's the big, one of the big problems. Um, and, and the censorship on information is an absolute nightmare because we should be able to share information. You know, we should be able to allow people to discover information about themselves. And we shouldn't have to hold that ransom for any really expensive consultations because I want to spend a heap of time with you to explain my beliefs. Yeah. And then they go, I don't want to pay for hours so you could talk to me. Just make it cheaper and tell me what to do. Yeah. And then it's, you know what I mean? It's so I think the information is so important and we need to do it because people have become so disconnected from the fact that we have our own, like we are part of it. We're an animal as part of a holistic system, which is the, you know, the earth and that, that we live on, that we are connected to everything and everyone. And there's this weird movement where it's like we're not even allowed to acknowledge that we have an immune system without it being a conspiracy you know it's like it's it's madness what has happened now and and all, uh, the podcasting scene is is really bad uh, the only people that are allowed to say things are the people that i don't know i don't know who's allowed to say anything actually it's also censored i was about to say the only people that say but i don't actually know anyone that can honestly just talk and share information and maybe, i thought maybe me <laughs> yeah well that's it that's it and that because i'm not funny. licensed <laughs> well, yeah yeah well that's well man i'm so glad so you know it's funny i'm no longer registered as a naturopath anymore um because i don't believe in what they're telling me i have to say and that they're saying that this if you're if you're a healthcare provider and that this is what you're supposed to say and they refer me through to the queensland health webpage or something and i'm just like well i don't that's not naturopathic. Um, that's not why. That's not my role in society, and I refuse to do that. Um, plus, it worked out that during all the crazy stuff, I mean, it was fine for me to be a consultant in a beauty clinic, but I couldn't be a healthcare provider in a wellness centre, you know. And so, I, I, I get really upset about the the censorship, and you know, through the history, the burning of the books. Can you imagine? how much discoveries have just been lost and how many, how many great like initiatives that could have been implemented, how, how much, oh man, can you just imagine, you know, I mean, like. That's why I like to take responsibility, you know what I mean? For that type of mm. stuff, to figure it out and learn new stuff, new ways to try and, you know, give people that, that chance, that freedom to just be the best version of themselves. Like, Yes. And, and to do that, we understand that, for them to achieve that basic right, all they need is access to quality, unbiased, accurate information and access to quality ingredients to be able to achieve whatever they want to do with themselves. And that's where I look at our role, you know, your role, my role, all of our other friends in this sort of space. Our role is to help people fight for their rights to access that um, because rather than being the the person that compromises everything all the time to just fit in and pay your bills. That's a very noble thing to be able to try to fight for someone's rights, to be able to access the information and the tools they need to find help yeah. in their yeah. own way. You yeah. know? So. And my, my main role is to hold people accountable to make sure they actually do it because going through learning all these things is one thing being preconditioned to do all the stuff that you normally do is another thing. And it takes effort and it's hard to like, change new conditions especially as you mentioned you were doing things for decades you know how hard it is to get out of that routine yeah so they need to come in and that's what i do i hold people like super accountable to make sure that they take action on all yeah. the things and, that they're trying to learn and you can and this is where i was dealing with that imposter syndrome for a period of time you're a healthy dude you know you live the life and you do the thing you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you can keep people accountable when i was like 30 kilos heavier than I am now when I was dealing with pain when I was dealing with all this sort of stuff man I was suffering so bad from imposter syndrome that there's no way I could actually get up on my high horse and and keep someone accountable when I could not even do it for myself and so that for me was a 
big turning point to and now i've got a new level of confidence where i've actually implemented a lot of my beliefs yeah and and got the girls going see i got the cannons i got my weapon check <laughs> <laughs> so like i love it and so now i feel so much better and now also i'm getting so much more respect from these people when i do keep them keep them accountable my company motto for my old company was um results not excuses and and what i used to do and this uh, i was a uh, happy to dude and that sort of stuff but I, I, I think I was a bit of a like an asshole too sometimes um because I was very passionate about everything um and and I just hated meetings um so uh, I and uh, so with the results and excuses you know sometimes we'd have these days and I used to this comes all from my old naturopath clinic because when I'm really busy I realize that I just sit there listening to pensioners talk all day and so I used to come in and just go look seriously man Today, we're really busy. So I've split the consultation form down into results or excuses, but we don't have time for your excuses today. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna document down your results. So go through your, your list of crap <laughs> you wanted to talk about, and let's just start with the results in case we run out of time. Oh, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you just yeah. start listing your results? You didn't now, have you know, any empathy for yourself, so you couldn't show it to other people. No, I was mean like that. And then and then I was like, and then so with work, I was, so that was my naturopath clinic. And I was a bit softer in the naturopath clinic because, you know, these people I understand, you know. Um, but at work, I, I wasn't so much because it was like, I work really hard for this. I, I set myself certain standards and effort like that. I, I wouldn't turn up to a meeting, you know, unless I'd done it. Um, or, or basically that Richard Branson post, you know, is it someone asks you, can you do it? Say yes, and then work it out later. That's all right if you're an entrepreneur, but not as an employee, you know, it's, it's like, so I was in one of those things where I was just like, man, seriously, you said you could do the thing, you didn't do it, you, you lied or whatever, you know, it's like this results, not excuses. I said, how could we build anything based on excuses? And that came out of that naturopath clinic and then it went into my work life and now it's then it, it really started probably the last thing to implement that belief system was myself <laughs> um because as i kind of called myself I, I eventually started to call my own bullshit and sit there going right so what's your excuses or results and that, you know so i think i was a big one. Oh, for sure <laughs> i'm actually really interested um and one thing is, I think there's two ways I want to go for this. I'll let, I'll let you choose. I think it's just the importance of like figuring out how you keep yourself accountable. But then I wanted to get, circle back on the the health thing, talking about the microbiome, was um, like fasting. Like, yeah. And, and what your thoughts on fasting was? So I used my dad as a guinea pig because he was like, um, you know, I really want to get healthy, and I was like, you sort of just need to lock into one thing that's going to wrap everything to keep him accountable. And after a lot of figuring out all the science and stuff for not intermittent fasting proper fasting one yeah. to three day fasts um he does not he went from like having cancer problems massive inflammation gut inflammation like lack of sex drive and bad leadership skills to all his blood tests are perfect consistently wow. one sign of cancer left in him he's lost well over 30 ki um, kilograms and i've had people sign up to my programs because they've talked to me that i want as much energy as your dad does because he runs laps around everyone He's wow. 50, he's 55. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely massive fan of it because, again, it fits in with the laws of nature. Now, when I talk about the laws of nature, I'm not talking about, like, you know, the, the, the boring stuff that we perceive, but the, the hard stuff. Have you ever got stranded anywhere? <laughs> oh, man, seriously. I even went fishing one afternoon um, and the four-wheel drive broke. We were stuck there for like four days. Um, Ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The absolute time of my life. I have yeah. never been so... We had another dude there in like fetal position the whole time freaking out and another guy there trying to be, stay cool. I never wanted to go home. Uh, we were living <laughs> off the land. We had a big bucket of water, so I was cool with that. Um, but no, the thing is, is when I was talking about before following the laws of nature, there is supposed to be proper phases of feast and famine. They will, you will get times where you seriously, the weather or whatever may happen and that that local fruit tree is not producing or something like that, or the animals are just not available or whatever you, like that is a full on 
important part of nature. And if we look at the fact that your gut microbiome is responsible for so many functions that are essential for phases of famine and, and fasting and that sort of stuff, it is absolutely crucial for your microbiome to have these regular resets because they'll go from a phase of abundance where they're just basically growing and filling you up with their you know, byproducts, potentially toxic metabolites and inflammatory sort of stuff. Um, and growth factors that contribute to cancers and everything like, because they're sitting there going, man, this person's in such a phase of abundance. Let's grow. Let's build, let's release growth factors, utilize this for a phase of growth. And then you're not surprised that we get cancer growth and abnormal cells at the same time with all that inflammation and growth factors being stimulated. But then when we go into the phases of fasting, we get the die off of the microbiome. We get they go a little bit dormant and that sort of stuff. The, the degree of inflammation that they release is significantly less. They're not making anywhere as many toxic postbiotic compounds. All of a sudden, they're like, man, we've got to give this dude some more nutrients. So they're capable of making things like branch chain amino acids, capable of making um, your B vitamins and all that different bits and pieces. They're also capable of utilizing a lot more of those nutrients that are possibly competing with each other. You know, like a, a common one, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the tryptophan steal in regards to the microbiome, where the bugs will steal the tryptophan away from the serotonin pathway, send it down another pathway, blah, blah, blah. And then you got no serotonin in your head. But at the same time, if you're overfeeding the other bugs with proteins, trying to get make sure you've got plenty of tryptophan coming through, you're generating branch chain amino acids that then compete for absorption with tryptophan into your brain and they make you awake instead. Of it. So all these sort of things get a chance to reset. They get a chance to change. But more importantly, the same way that we go through phases of survive and thrive, we need the same stresses on our microbiome. Um, so I think it's very important. Um, I think oh. to answer your question, I agree with it. <laughs> oh, me too. I think I think it's like one thing that like some bodybuilders nail if if they've got uh, diversity in their diet is that whole yeah. feast and famine thing. How important yeah. is what clicked in my mind and it's just the whole symbolism of birth and rebirth. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, and it's and cycles. You know, yeah, yeah naturopath. It's like these weird numbers of seven. You know, like everything's got like seven year cycles or twenty one day cycles or three lots of sevens. And we have these weird cycles. I bet you one day we discover that they link in with different growth rates of microbiome, you know, different <laughs> seeding. Because I know, like, there's some research I read that some of the microbiome that feed on specific fruit sugars and that sort of stuff, they can live. Typically, they lay dormant for up to nine months. But this is a, a big thing about rebound weight gain. Okay, so, okay, you imagine if you build, you're working on your before photo, all right? You know, so you're getting bigger. Um, we know that there's like 10 times as many bugs in your guts as there are whole cells in your whole body. So if you're getting a lot more fat cells and you're growing a bigger body, then your microbiome is 10 times that to achieve that growth. Now, what we often will do is we might, cut calories or some people might specifically cut calories from a particular type of food whether it's fat or carbs or something like that for a period of time to reduce their calories and then they'll get into a calorie deficit and lose the weight and lose some weight for a period of time right getting cravings getting all these sort of things along the way um, from their microbiome now if we consider that that microbiome can lay dormant and wait for nine months for that food to come back now when that Food comes back. The microbiome's like, you little bloody ripper, fruit season's back. Shut down. Let's fatten the person back up again. So your body size, body shape and metabolism is predetermined by your microbiome. You can starve the, your body for a period of time to create the adaptation of fat loss. Um, however, if you haven't actually reset the gut, then the whole time you're doing it, your, your microbiome, my, microbes are sitting there saying, feed me this. I'm missing it. I'm starving because you've taken away my carbs or you've taken away my milk or you've taken away something. And a lot of those cravings you're getting is the microbiome as they're dying off. Um, but the rest of the time, they can just lay their dormant. And you look at most campaigns, you know, people are looking at three months, you know, like a 12 week or six to eight week or 12, I don't know. People do those sort of campaigns and in amongst it, they might do throw a 30 it. week. <laughs> yeah. So what you find, these little buggers, man, um, you have to understand that if we're not 
changing our diet to kill off the overgrowth of the microbiome that contributed to us being um, bigger, then you're going to go back to the way you were. And that's the importance of changing the diet to be holistic and not just cutting calories, you know, so actually going I, back. I got a question in, in regards mm -hmm. to this, just because my mind always thinks of like, I have this thing in the back of my brain is I always think next action steps. What can I yeah. do? What can I do? I'm just like thinking right now is like, well, the best way to go about that surely is to just to get your microbiome tested. And is that what you would recommend? Like if people like yeah. wanted to take yep. this seriously, go get your microbiome tested, check yep. it out. So then you're not making any, you know, rash decisions and talk to someone who knows the overgrowth. Yeah, that's the tricky bit because even the testing companies okay. are a little bit restricted into what they're allowed oh, to tell you with the reports. It. Yeah, so, but I'll tell you another trick though, what I found out was what I realized over a lot of time is the first test, I found a lot of it. You can, if people have got like that, those, those signs and symptoms of dysbiosis or signs and symptoms of an overgrowth. What do they look like, by the way? Oh, like basically there'll be a lot more fermentation and most of these microbes should be isolated into the large intestine. So they start to grow up into the small intestine where they'll feed on carbs earlier, bloat things up. Often these people get worse with enzymes and that sort of stuff. A lot of inflammation. You got to realize that your whole microbiome contents is basically split between little things and big things, mm. which is why your immune system's split that way with cellular, cellular immunity will engulf and remove the little things. And then we will use humoral immunity to flush away the big things. So you can look at the symptom picture and see what their immune system's doing. You can do organic acid testing and find um, microbial metabolites in the urine and get a fair indication. But typically looking for things like candidiasis, dysbiosis, SIBO, which is bloating, fatigue, inflammation, um, immune dysregulation, and that sort of stuff. So what I found is in most of those cases with an overgrowth, the, the initial treatment didn't change. So we go and do this testing. And that's so microbe testing, for example, it's quite a few hundred dollars and can take up to six weeks to get your results. Um, so you go and do this testing and then it doesn't change your initial prescription. The initial prescription will be reduce the amount of food you're feeding them and throw in some extra poisons to kill off the overgrowth. Um, and then you kind of have a guess of whether we're like a parasites, fungi, mold or bacteria. But at the end of the day, we'll often do a little bit of each. So what I find is we go in initially with a specific protocol to starve the little bugs and kill off a little bit of the overgrowth and get some changes happening. And I find that the second test is actually more beneficial. So I'll often won't do the first test um, and we just get in and start cranking and you'll find so many symptoms disappear. So many, the white noise, I call it and go around. And then you'll find, you know, that, that real important point that you'll find something way out of whack, you know, like an overgrowth of one bug and a deficiency of another that is resistant to that initial treatment and that second one. But I really like microbe testing. I think it's excellent because they give, it's one of the only testing that gives you that, the doses of the bugs. It tells you not just, you know, you've got these bugs and you've got a lot of them, but they'll say this one's the percentages are right out of whack. You know, and that's the stuff I find is really helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so crazy as well. Like a lot of this stuff is also for, you know, treating disease and things, but I'm always coming up as how do I optimize the total human experience yeah. of stuff with trying different things in terms of um, cacao ceremony or Ty was telling me, you know, for friends of Ty, have a massive dose of kava. Feels amazing. Yeah. yeah <laughs> no, all, these different things cool, can, hey. all these different things that you can use, which have just never been out there, which I find so fascinating yeah and, yeah and and so amazing because you know we get to to um do all of this yeah yeah i know i know and then, then that whole thing and then you have a look at something like kava all right so kava brilliant calming calming compound it's also it doesn't have any direct effects in kava well not very powerful effects of influencing things like serotonin and that sort of stuff it's more of a calming on the you know gabinergic sort of systems mm. and that sort of stuff however when you actually go and research kava as a drink and you actually start to realize that kava itself as a root is a very high levels of polyphenols kava is a very potent antifungal 
and also a very good antimicrobial and specifically seems to target a lot of the microbes associated with that tryptophan steel, allowing you to have more serotonin naturally. So synergistically, yeah. And you see what I mean? The other thing Carver does, yeah, muscle relaxation. <laughs> it helps to drop the traps, you sit back, reduces that excessive mental chatter. And then you find, hang on, so it's also having this amazing effect in our mouth, it's having these effects on our oral microbiome. It's, it's, it's like, and then you go back and go, oh, wow, what are they? And then you find these patterns. This is why I'm so obsessed with herbal medicine because I love the fact that there is no specific target for any of these herbs. They all have synergistic combination effects. Oh. And you'll find that so many of these herbs, like turmeric, it, it, it's like amazing how turmeric become as popular as it did because it's, it's so effective. Yeah, so, so turmeric is so effective as these things. And it was popular like that for centuries, decades. And then some clown went and did a bioavailability and said, oh, but it doesn't get absorbed. So therefore, it never worked. And then it created this whole thing of going, now we have to get turmeric to work with modern technology by making it get absorbed. It's just like, hang on, you just started the conversation by saying turmeric has worked for thousands of years. <laughs> that's, why, that's why you were looking at it. I mean, that's why you were, that's, it's crazy. Hey, that's why you did the study. And now you're saying that you've done the study and now you're using modern science to say it doesn't get absorbed. Therefore, everything we thought we knew for thousands of years was wrong because of this clown said that you need black pepper. Well, guess what? He put black pepper in his and that's why he did that study. Now let's go back and research why and how does turmeric work for the thousands of years knowing that it doesn't get absorbed. Oh, wow. It interacts with our first pass metabolism through our liver. It works with our microbiome. It works with NRF2 activation receptors all through our gut. And then guess what? It converts to a postbiotic. And if you had actually measured, instead of your one or two hours area under the curve, you actually measured overnight to see what happens after it gets the chance to feed the microbiome. You'll see that it gets converted into amazing stuff that gets absorbed as well. Oh. After doing all that amazing stuff that you just bypass black pepper <laughs> oh, i've got some turmeric up in the fridge in a minute i'm gonna spank that after this call yeah yeah Man, where do you get carver from by the way where do you get where oh, you, is amazon only ever, noble Can just got to go noble fiji carver because it's the only so with carver there's a right, lot of down. different varieties yeah go noble and you can go to just google noble noble n-o-b-l-e l-e yeah yeah noble fiji carver because there's like a few different strains of carver around and a few different places supplying it. There's one, there's, a, there's an old joke about one that's called two day carver because it gave you a two day hangover. Um, but I don't know if you remember a few years ago, carver was restricted because it had some problems with the liver. Um, so had some people abusing it and that sort of stuff and dodgy products um, that didn't actually have carver in it that caused liver damage and they banned carver. Um, but um, noble Fiji Kava gets it from this, the original island that has a massive volcano in it and they, they get it from the inside of this volcano and it's the original story. Oh man, no, it's so cool. So this particular place in Fiji, so it's this big volcano um, and it's got this famous warrior tribe of Fijians that no one could ever invade that island. That island was resistant. This family's had it the whole time. Now famous for their kava that grows inside this volcano. And, but what they did is they have these massive, awesome Fijian warrior dudes standing at the crest of this volcano. So no one could kind of get up and get into this thing. So that particular place has kava that is just superior to all the other forms of kava. And when you actually look at the profile of it, it's very, very different. Um, and they would also use it just, uh, they didn't do a lot of that chewing and spitting in their culture with it as well. They did just a lot of the grinding and boiling and that sort of stuff. So that the noble Fiji kava were the original families that owned the islands that then what they've done now, and this is the other thing I really like about the company itself, is they've gone, they're listed on the stock market, I believe, but they, all their investors are all the key, uh, the Fiji Kava farming families. Oh. So they have like thousands of investors, just Ma and Pa people that basically oh. put their family savings into investing into this company. And this company then works with a lot of the local suppliers and works with them in their farming ability and creates like a co-op where they collect the Kava, process it all beautifully, do all the testing, and that sort of stuff. That just so, my heart. Then, that does. Oh man! And they're a great company. They're really cool people. I go have regular uh, 
carver sessions with them. Our oh. offices at West Ten, we sit in and do the bull. Oh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, we do it before meetings. Yes, we yeah. do it before meetings because it removes it reduces excessive mental chatter. And, and one of the other things that got me excited about Carver in the early days is there was a lot of studies on it that, that kind of suggested it may actually be a very useful tool for us trying to fix this opioid epidemic. You know, that we're going through these issues with the whole world's gone mad killing themselves with these opioids. And Carver is a really nice, safe and effective way uh, and a good alternative for those sort of drugs and being all nice and natural and supporting communities the way it does. I think it's a great, a really I, I love that product. Oh. And I drink a lot of it <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's really kind of cool and I, a lot of athletes do not many people know this but um uh, it's one of the major reasons I believe behind um the success of the All Blacks so mm. I don't know if you know so with the, the All Blacks so, uh, and another friend of mine that designed them whoop things um yeah. uh, Med, Will Ahmed you know whoop he was telling me that one of the biggest problems with the um um athletes is alcohol and takes them according to the data he collected out of those whip bands you know the ones I'm talking yeah, about, I know the whip bands, yeah yeah i, yeah, I yeah. use oring but um oh yeah 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 so those one of the he was will, will was brewing to talk to you sharing all this data and really? stuff that they wow. where people go through and submit data and he just shows the patterns in their recovery but alcohol was the biggest one he said it could take up to five or six days to recover from drinking after a game of footy and if you consider that leaves you not much time before you're playing again and drinking again. Um, and what the, what actually works really well when people use things like carver. Carver is anti-inflammatory. Carver is a pain reliever. Carver is antimicrobial and all that sort of stuff. But it also makes you feel a little bit stoned. And if you have a couple of beers with it, you're all off chops and ready for bed. And so <laughs> the funny thing is, is so with the All Black, they, they, a lot of these guys would actually get into the habit of doing their little carver ceremony as part of their ritual after the game as a team bonding exercise and then do the carver sort of stuff, which helps their pain, makes them calm. They're fine to have a couple of beers and that sort of stuff, but they don't actually want to then go out drinking vodka and Red Bull until five in the morning. Oh yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Even that, even not even that. I mean, a lot of professional athletes, you get really wired up after those games. So often you'll be sitting there, they'll be playing Xbox until five in the morning. Yeah. You know, well, um, just because they just can't sleep. They and so the car, love it. Best best post-workout recovery thing. Makes sense because like when you're in a rugby game, or whatever, it's like as if you're going to war, like literally with another tribe and the yeah. Fijian tribes are there and they probably use it after to like calm themselves down when they were warring with other states. That makes yeah, so much exactly. sense. Yeah, exactly. But they even used to do it before all their meetings. Yeah, so yeah. before tribal meetings and community gatherings, that was a part of the ritual to reduce the amount mm. of talking. So, and the funny thing is you have these carbon meetings compared to another meeting and everyone's kind of like calm. You know, you know, like uh, you know, a lot of boardroom meetings, there's a lot of egos in the room, you know? So a lot of people listen to reply as opposed to listening to understand. So when you're in these meetings, you'll see these people as you talk and they're kind of like, it's like, you know, when you jump rope and you're kind of like time it, waiting for the rope to go in. So they're doing that with a conversation and they're waiting for a pause long enough to go in. Oh yeah, let me agree, disagree, or tell you a story really quickly. <laughs> you know? The Carver meetings, everyone's like mellow, just sitting back and someone will say something, everyone's sitting back, quite happy to listen. And because it doesn't make you dopey, it actually makes you more focused. So if, 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 you're a, if your brain rattles around like mine does, where you just, just too much, I just need sometimes things that calm me, you know, cannabis, kava, those sort of things that go through and just reduce the amount of excessive mental chatter can just allow me to just focus. And in meetings, it's a really nice thing as well. Do you like yeah. matcha or cacao ceremonies? Do you like I haven't them? done much, man. I've never done them. Um, yeah. Never done a so, matcha one? No. Oh, no, man. I don't think so. I've done some really cool green tea ceremonies and that sort of stuff, but I've never done a matcha ceremony. Oh, of, oh man. I no, reckon I've most... never done ayahuasca or something either. Oh, have you? I've told about, ayahuasca. A lot of people tell me I should do it. <laughs> I don't know if that mean, what that means about me. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But, I think they're probably just like hearing you talk about it. Um, I really like... Um, uh, Matcha. I'm not sure if you researched into matcha much. It's a pretty, yeah, pretty yeah. wild product. Yeah, yeah. Now, which one? So you're talking about the green tea. The green tea, yeah. but it's just the leaves that have been ground, like stone ground yep. from uh, Kyoto um, yep. in Japan. Wild. Yeah. Like 
that yeah, stuff. So I've read all about it. It's another one of those stupid things that I read all about it, know a lot about it, never done it. Oh yeah, I, rec- I recommend. Yeah. I, oh, I love I'm matcha so much. You gotta mm-hmm. be careful if you don't empty stomach, nauseous. But if not, yeah. it's like, I think it's like coffee on steroids, but without the crash. It's um yeah. Well, it should. It should because I mean, one of the beautiful things about the polyphenols found in the green teas, as opposed to the the polyphenols in the coffee, is that they actually help to downregulate some of the uh, adrenaline receptors and that sort of stuff in the brain. So you get the same dose of catecholamine relief, but you don't get the anxiety from it because it dampens so down. So yeah, good. yeah, it's really it's so, cool. It's so I like good. It. I, I highly recommend it more than like for myself personally. Every time I'm like, oh, why do I not have this all the time? And all yeah. the ECGs and stuff in there, it's like, oh yeah. Kills, yeah. can- kills cancer, by the way, while you're at it. If people are worried about their diet and getting cancer, like, probably take much. I think I might have <laughs> done a half ass matcha ceremony once. The first time I went to Whole Foods in America, I got too excited and they had these like little matcha, like little scrotums full of ice cream or something. Yeah. I just couldn't stop. I couldn't leave. I just ate them all. <laughs> Yeah, was so just sitting there. Just, give us another box of those they're amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah i kind of do no. like um much bulletproof so i'll sort of mix it with oh yeah like, fats and stuff just so it has like a real good dose because you want sort of those uh fats in there because of the nauseous stuff if you have it like i mean yeah. just make you feel nauseous i'm like screw that so i'll have it yeah. with you know certain milks oils and butters and stuff whatever to uh, you know make sure it digests or have it with you know bone broth <laughs> like bone broth matches yeah before. yeah i don't recommend it. it doesn't taste that good just purely for the effect having yeah. like an actual matcha drink and then bone broth after usually and then i'm like it's like a whole day I'm just, really? why am i so on today this is the best yeah oh that's awesome no yeah. i definitely want to try that and the same yeah. with the cacao and that oh. sort of stuff so oh, and i'll be i'll just be stupidly obsessed with <laughs> oh, yeah you know? cacao ceremonies so. are pretty wild I, yeah? I i like to say that they um uh strength they're like going to the gym for gratitude is essentially yeah. what it's like is that right yeah it's you that the level of appreciation and awareness because you can't heat it up too much because it ruins the yeah. theobromine or whatever yeah 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 cacao. so you got to just melt it really slow and then you know make sure you put in whatever you know, coconut milk or whatever in there and then like yeah have it salt certain and then once you finally get it and you drink it and you wait there you're like what am I in love with right now? Everything. <laughs> is that right? Is that right? Because you're going to get a big dopamine surge and everything from Oxytocin it as well. With the yeah. sign, what I've researched, I haven't got like yeah. more detail stuff, but what I've researched to see it, just a big oxytocin because of the antioxidants, it just pumps so much around you. You can literally feel it. Like you feel your heart in your chest. Going, oh, mm-hmm. nice. No, and, and oxytocin, um, they've done recent studies on oxytocin found it to be the most anabolic of all hormones so when it when it comes to recovery and regeneration i mean we much we would be much better off with soft porn in the squat rack than that angst and aggression you know in a gym you know like this the oxytocin is the most powerful thing for regenerating collagen connective tissue it's the most anabolic of all hormones i think trenbolone is the most famous Anabolic, well, they called it an androgenic steroid, uh, androgenic anabolic steroid, where it's supposed to have the most potent testosterone like effects for muscle growth. They just found out in a recent study it has 50 times the amount of oxytocin activity. And that they now believe, yeah, they actually believe it by this. Actually, have you ever, there's a cool compound called olea, olea, I don't know how to say it, OEA, but oleoil ethanolamide which is basically a compound that comes from olive oil. Um, and it, it directly interacts with oxytocin receptors. And they found it actually very powerful. Yeah, I think from memory, uh, it was as low as 350 milligrams as, of olive oil. There's the first bit, I don't know how to say it. Olive, olive oil, oil, olive oil. <laughs> it's, it's like that. It's always like olive oil as an olive oil. we know what um, we mean though olive oil yeah olive oil, yeah olive oil, i used yeah. to mix it with a lot of the anabolic protocols that i do for the athletes um very good for recovery very good for re- regeneration very similar to palmitol oil ethanolamide which is pea which is a very powerful pain reliever pea is um, in cacao as well yeah 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 yeah, and PR, that comes from the palm tool. So that comes out of the saturated fats as well. So having that more of the saturated fat linked in with your blend would help the absorption of that as well, which wow. is kind of very cool. Yeah, yeah. So, oh. you know, oh, as you were man, saying that, fun. I had a click. This is so amazing because 
Um, obviously I compete in like fitness competitions and stuff like that, but also even just for my own mindset, because I know we want as much testosterone and stuff, especially as a man pumping through our body as, as, as possible, especially when we're getting yeah. older and with all the business that I run, the hierarchies that I create and stuff, I've got like some things behind here for all the stuff, help, helping people's mindsets overcome themselves and smash the hero's journey. I was like, well, I need to have the most energy as possible, the most testosterone as possible. Yep. And I read that somewhere that oxytocin was awesome. Now through the stuff yeah. that I've researched, I understand really clearly that in order to feel love you need to create the opportunity to essentially be good enough in some sort of area to give someone else so that they can receive and then you can say thank you to them for receiving yeah so what yeah. i would and that's how you feel love and connection so i would yeah. intentionally every single day do one thing and give as much love as i could to one person somehow whether it's just sending them a really nice text or giving them a, a phone call and just telling them like sincerely acknowledging, not just like blowing smoke up their ass, but I got to think about this for a bit about what I want to say yeah. to this person and how uh -huh. I can be as grateful as possible um, to them for these things. And I couldn't, I, when I was doing it consistently every single day, now it's just when yeah. I feel it, I, I try to express it as best as possible. But when yeah. I was doing it consistently every single day, like nothing could have stopped me. I, I, yeah. I, I recommend it to everyone, especially in my program. And one of the weeks that we got on my, it says tell, express love, every single yep. day for a week, send someone a big message and they're like, I've, I've never felt better. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what, there's a very strange link and I don't understand it fully, um, but it's something I should probably research more so I do understand it better. But there's a very important link where oxytocin can offset the side effects of excessive androgens. So for example, yeah, yeah. And, and where that, yeah, polycystic ovarian syndrome is where that was discovered. So they found that women that get the androgen dominant uh, conditions such as the polycystic ovarian syndrome, hirsutism, acne, and all that sort of stuff, a lot of their symptoms can be fixed with oxytocin. And if you just consider polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is that pain, the abdominal pain, and potentially infertilities, these sort of stuff, painful sex, painful intercourse, we're looking at acne, hirsutism is the dark hair growth, you know, the, the chins and the whiskers. These people need love and they need to feel that love and they need to love themselves. And without that, they don't get the oxytocin. The androgens are just well and truly over the top. And this is the whole point. Then you go to the gym because you're like, man, I've got to beat myself up because I've got this insulin resistance syndrome, probably coming oh. off the bat or something. And then you've got to realize that, no, man, you just got to love. Like, you don't want to go and go listen to heavy metal, get angst and sit there going, yeah, they're probably looking at my skin or I've got this bloated gut um, that no matter how hard I train, I just can't get rid of this and I hate it and I hate myself because of it. And it's just got to, you just got to understand that that vicious cycle builds androgens and those androgens make the aggression and the hate there. You need that oxytocin to offset them. You need to give yourself a hug. Matt, yeah. that is the most powerful thing that I've ever heard on probably a podcast ever. Yeah. I'm not so saying what about that. blokes? But you yeah. think about the blokes. The it's the same thing. Same, same hormonal profile. Male pattern baldness, acne, prostate problems, erectile dysfunctions. So you've got to go through and go, for, in order for you to give love, you've got to be able to love yourself. And, that, and I'm talking biochemistry, not just astrology <laughs> or whatever. You know what I mean? Like I am serious. So this on a hormonal profile, the, the ratios of hormones are so much more important than the amounts. And it's the ratios that will determine how you manifest your response to these, these hormone levels. Otherwise your receptors just are, are compromised, you know? So, yeah. I'm like speechless. No, it's cool, huh? There's so much stuff going in my mind. That is that's yeah. the most powerful thing I've ever heard on a podcast or audio book or anything ever. And I'm not just saying that like oh, that's, wow. that's straight up. Like the most, because especially in the industry that I work in with men and like, yeah. like, because my programs are all helping men optimize themselves and business yep. owners become the best version of themselves. But um, even I get a lot of women reach out for certain things. And after this, it's like, man, I'm just going to tell my lady that I love her and give her a hug and do that enough. But like, get some yeah. more in there. But literally, yeah, I have this, but I have they got to believe it. And they got to believe also, it. Yeah. Yeah. They got to believe it. They got to trust man. you as a man too. Yeah. But yeah. It, well, exactly. And also, you have to deliver as a man as well. Yeah. We yeah. know where oxytocin comes from. It's the orgasm chemical. And like, there needs to be two people doing that orgasm if you want a healthy relationship. You know, it's one of those things that, and it's not just the orgasm chemical, the, when I say ejaculation chemical, 
Mm. You know, this is a sort of thing where part of sexual maturity of being a man is understanding that. May I speak on that? that? Yeah, I, yeah I, I love. Sorry, sorry for interrupting, but may I speak? No, on that? go. I so much researching. I've done I'm so not much, an expert on this. Yeah, <laughs> so I've done so much research in this with relationships. Um, like I don't market myself as much as like a relationship coach, but I do a lot of relationship coaching because it just comes. I'll, I'll walk you through my hierarchy in a second. And yep. essentially one of the most important things that I learned from John Gray and researching a lot of him and David Dieter and a few other people um, for men's mindsets to understand. And one thing that I did is like I quit masturbating. And one of the most amazing things about that is it motivates me to do the right necessary things in order to warm your partner up so that she can have the best experience in bed. For example, yep. Um, I just it, like a couple of weeks ago, I felt myself like my sexual energy just started going, Phew. I'm like, okay, this is through the roof right now. So I messaged her, for example, and I said this, this is going to explain the system more than anything else. Messaged her, I said, Hey, like, just wanted to let you know, what are some things that I can do for you in the next week that is going to make you feel as much love as possible? Because I want to have the most beautiful sexual experience on the weekend. Is that social love? Is that taking you out on a date? Is it all these things? She was like, that is the most beautiful thing anyone's like ever messaged me because yeah. I understand talking from in terms of reaching climax and orgasm. John Gray says, you know, um, as, he, as he mentioned, he's like, well, girls have to feel so much oxytocin before the sexual experience that they even get to that position. And it makes sense. Yeah. Even just a date, they get to feel clean, make themselves look sexy and pretty so that they're desirable. I sort of, as a guy in my own head, I use the term as like, I'm going on a hunt. Like, you know, I'm yeah, hunting yeah. now. And yeah. food never tastes so good until you fast and you eat it. It's the same thing yep. with the sexual experience. And you can do all the things and warm up instead of just like toss yourself off and then be like, oh, cool. Now I'm holding myself. Like I, I feel comfortable now. I don't have to do all of these things to yeah. like make this experience as best as possible. And it has worked wonders for my own life her life and the sexual encounter and the love that we experience together too. I think it's amazing. Thank you for saying that because right now my mind's on this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's crazy. Hey, because I mean, a lot of guys, I mean, me included, you know, most of my life, you just going through the, you just do your thing. You just think, Oh, you're either compatible or you're not <laughs> yeah. like, uh, you're like, you know, like you're either, you can influence it. Yeah. And then you realize that, well, then you realize that there's, it is such an important thing in regards to psychology and happiness and, and satisfaction with life, uh, resentment, all sorts of other issues that can creep up into relationships can simply come from the fact that it may not be even when it comes to the sharing of the orgasms and the ability to not just ejaculate, but feel the oxytocin. And also understanding that bro, bro love and, and friendships, oh, yes. um, support and um, that sort of stuff where you've got a group of mates around that can actually support you rather than compete with you and stuff like that um, is, is, is a good thing that blokes have. Women, I don't see a great deal of women having that from a lot of their peers in my experience. There, there definitely will be um, many out there that, that do have that um, network, but a lot of that's relied on their partner. And then if their partner is not providing them with that, that over the top, oxytocin support so this is where i understand you know romantic and, and all that sort of stuff a little bit better um but seriously it took it took, for, wild, took pretty much for everything to be to break yeah and, and, and i'm being a bit, little bit honest here but i basically got a little bit too caught up with my own life you basically re neglect your family and that sort of stuff to go and also you basically get into this position where you just think oh well you know this is how long it takes me to go. This is how long it takes you to go. Or like stupid things, man. Like um, sex is the only race where there's no second place. If you don't come first, you don't come at all. <laughs> you know, that sort of shit. It's just like all of a sudden it's like, hang on. No, this is a teamwork thing. That's that bloody tie, that bleeping on my computer is that tie fella keep bugging me. <laughs> By Lucas. Um, so no, the, the funny thing is, is that is such an important thing. But then what happens is what the vicious cycle that happens is some blokes feel powerful through dominance or through powerful through power um just acquiring power it's crazy however what they never may never have experienced is how good you feel from the power of delivering orgasms at will and and making sure that your partner is totally satisfied in that area it's amazing um what we did actually we got into a real bad rut where it was just kind of shit 
you know, where you just, I don't want sex, but I'll lie here while you have it sort of thing. Uh, and then, um, but we were very competitive, my wife and I. Um, someone come through and showed us a thing called the 30 day sex challenge. I'll see if I can find it on my phone, but it was basically every day for 30 days, just a different sexual, you know? And, and then it was like, can we do the 30 day sex challenge? Um, and we started that and it went for years. Wow. Um, because we were both, both initially were sitting there going, she won't do this. I'll do it, but she won't. And she's going, he, he won't. I'll do it, but he won't. And then, <laughs> right, well, I'll prove you. I'm not going to be the guy that's going to say no. But then, like you're saying with the masturbation, is when you're having sex every day, and part of that is wanting to have a proper ejaculation and, and deliver a proper, you know, that's a powerful thing in itself. That's a sign of your manliness is how much you can actually go. Um, you'd stop masturbating because you need to be prepared for that evening. And if you're doing it every day, it's just like, I'm not going to lose my seat over here because yeah. I'm going to need this later because I've yeah. got big plans for that, you know? And then all of a sudden, that in with that comes that whole intimacy, that connection. But then also you get to that end of the day and you just go, now we're going to have sex tonight, guaranteed. Um, I better be nice. <laughs> I, don't, I, you know, I don't want to start that argument right now because it's going to be really awkward you know yeah. like oh so true. you know yeah so all of a sudden you start choosing your attitude a little bit different you start making a little bit different decisions and deciding oh. and maybe we don't have to have this conversation today or maybe we could have it a little bit different you know and that sort of stuff or maybe i can actually do a little bit more to prep for this oh. you know as well um Matt, so important eh? <laughs> you're, you're a world-class stud where can people find ah! you? oh wow well, for what? Do you talking about my OnlyFans sort of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Link no. the OnlyFans below. Man. No, I did. I did. I've got a web page called mattleg.com. Yep. Um, and I have an email that's matt at mattleg.com. Yep. <laughs> and so I made that easy for people. Um, we also, Kai's helping me. I'm terrible normally with social media and stuff like that. So Kai's helping me out with that. So I'm, I'm now on I'm, I'm, I'm leggy leg or something on Instagram, but I'll, I'll share all these links for you, but we have these Facebook groups and we have a new project to look out for called the X trials. Um, so look out for the X trials and I'll send you some links or something that we yes, can get please. into the Facebook groups because the extra, everything I was talking about trying to get a heap of like-minded cool people together that is interested in accessing the information that I have and accessing the information that my network of experts has uh, interested in maybe getting together for like workshops and innovation days and maybe health retreats. And, but more importantly, anyone that wants to get in and be, get into a bit of lab rat action where we can share some information, make some discoveries about ourselves, but also trial some new products that might be um, making or we, we discover some new solutions to problems. So I'm really keen to get into that. Um, oh. So keep an eye out for that. And I don't actually, just the X trials and um, look for me at these things. 100% Matt, thanks. Kyle will probably get really mad at me saying, I gave you a link, so I can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that's all right. I'll share all the links below. Thank you so much for coming on to the show, Matt. Oh, thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. It's good fun. Yeah, it was.